So, hey everybody, uh, my name's Corey Chamblin. Uh, I am a programmer, I write back-end software uh, at a company called PagerDuty. Um, but uh, today, I'm not gonna talk about any of that stuff, I'm gonna talk about something way sweeter. I'm gonna talk about how to build video games uh, in Ruby. Um, I don't do this for my job, but I like to write games, and I think Ruby's a good language to do it in. Um, so the GitHub for the talk, uh, github.com slash Chamberlain, you can go there, uh, download the slides, download all the code for the talk. Uh, so first, uh, we're gonna talk about kind of the reasons why you might wanna make games, or why you, you might try to get into this as like a hobby, just something to do on the weekends. Uh, we're gonna talk about why Ruby is a pretty good choice for, uh, for getting started in making games. Uh, the second bit there, the main chunk of the talk, we're going to talk about how games are structured in, in pretty much every game framework out there. Uh, we're going to talk about Gosu, which is an amazing little library in Ruby uh, for building your own games. And uh, we're going to talk about how to write pieces of games that you might want to build by building a couple uh, toy games uh, using Gosu. Uh, and if we have a little bit of time at the end, we're going to talk about a few resources for aspiring independent game developers uh, so if you're not an artist, you can go get some open source artwork or some uh, open source music, uh, sound effects, and, and maybe some tools uh, that you might use uh, in, in building your own games. Uh, so first of all, why do I make games and, and why should you make games? So I like to make games because it reminds me of, of when I very first started programming. Uh, back in the day, we would get these these giant books of, of basic programs. And they were games, and you would spend your whole afternoon typing this stupid program into your computer, and you would get to the end, and you would type run, and if you were very lucky and you didn't make any mistakes, you would blow yourself away with a really bad game. Um, no, but it was, it was exciting in the sense that I typed this thing in and something happened on my computer. And that is a, a real visceral kind of creative feeling that I think all professional programmers need to find some way to get that. Um, the first time I hooked up an Arduino to my computer and I made the little light blink on it, I, I wrote some code into a thing and I pressed play and a thing that was not my computer did something else. That was a similar feeling for me. Um, so I think, I think you should try to write games if you don't already have an outlet like this. See if games are that for you and if not, I highly encourage you to go find some way to creatively express yourself with your craft because it's very important to grow as an engineer, as a, as a programmer, that you can, you can express yourself creatively. Uh, so what about Ruby? Uh, nobody considers Ruby a high performance programming language. Uh, so is Ruby the right tool for the job? For, is it the right tool to build games in? So when I, when I first became a professional programmer, I first had some interest in writing games, you know, because a lot of people get into programming because of writing games, and I, I think games are sweet. So I was like, okay, well, you know, I can write stuff. I have a computer science degree. Um, so what do I need to know to write games? And I thought, man, okay, well, I need to go learn C++. I need to go learn half a dozen graphics libraries. I need to know, you know, what, SDL stands for. Like I felt like there was so much I had to learn uh, to get out there to, to write games. Uh, but none of that is actually true. Um, so almost every language out there, every, every language out there has some library uh, where you can write really nice 2D independent style games, very commercially popular. These are the games I love to write, I love to play. And that's, that's a ton of the kind of games. Ruby is no exception. Uh, we have Gosu in Ruby, and there's plenty of power in Ruby to write, uh, write these simple games uh, that are very full and very satisfying to write. Uh, photographers often say that the best camera that, that you can have is the one you have with you. Um, so if you want to make games, don't feel like, okay, well, there's just so much I need to know to do that. You can make games today. If you know how to write Ruby programs, you can write games. So go make your games with Ruby. If you feel like later on, okay, well, I'm feeling kind of hamstrung, I need a little more performance, uh, the lessons you learn writing games in Ruby, the lessons you learn writing games in Gosu, ports very well to 
uh, to the more commercial tools. I, I poked around in Unity. I wrote a couple games using Unity, uh, just having background writing games in Gosu. And the vocabulary, the, the semantics of writing games, the structure of games is very similar across the board. So you can, get, uh, you can kind of get your sea legs writing games in Ruby, and if you want to go do this professionally, totally room to grow uh, into those higher end tools. But for me, I found out, hey, I love Ruby. Ruby's a great language, and uh, I'm not making a ton of money writing games, so I'm going to have fun doing it. I'm going to write my games in Ruby. Uh, so let's get into the, the kind of meat of the talk here. Um, Gosu games can just be one class. So we inherit from a window class in Gosu, and you only have to implement three methods generally. And these three methods, you're gonna see them all over in game development. Uh, so you, like every game framework literally I've ever used has had these three methods be the primitives uh, for, for building games. Uh, the first thing is the constructor of your game. Uh, so this is responsible for doing things like setting up the window details, like what's the size of the window? Uh, what's the title on top of it? Is the game full screen? What's the resolution, if so? Uh, kind of the graphics setup of your game. Uh, it's responsible for loading assets from disk. So things like your image files, your sounds, and your music files, for reasons we'll talk about in a second, you don't want to be reading those things off disk in the middle of the game. Uh, you want quick access to them. So the, uh, the constructor is responsible for loading all those things into memory. Uh, finally, it's responsible for setting up the initial game state. So things like, well, I have three lives. So the initialize says lives equals three. It's not very complicated. Level is one. Very simple stuff. Uh, the state of the game as the game begins, it's responsible for that. Uh, so this is called, when your game first runs, uh, this is called the setup method in, in most game frameworks. So after this gets done running, uh, the game enters into an infinite loop. And that, that infinite loop is called the game loop. Uh, and then we call the other two methods in sequence in that game loop over and over again. Uh, the first of those methods is the update method. And uh, it's responsible for uh, detecting and responding to user input. So, uh, did the user press the B button? Okay, what do I do? Uh, did the user press the right arrow? What do I do? Um, it's also responsible for updating all of the state of the game. So, if the user pressed the B button, I'm shooting a fireball. Uh, if the user pressed the right arrow, I'm, I'm adjusting the player's position five pixels to the right. That kind of stuff. Uh, finally, the draw method. It's responsible for drawing the current state of the game to the screen. So it doesn't change anything about the game. It just goes through, say, all of our image assets and says, okay, well, based on the state of the game right now, I'm going to draw the hero right here. Uh, I'm going to put three hearts in the top right corner, all this kind of stuff. Uh, and so these are called in a loop, the game loop. And each time we go through that loop, that's called a frame. And uh, however fast we're going through that loop, that's called the frame rate. Uh, and Gosu tries to run games at 60 frames a second, uh, but obviously if you have a bunch of stuff in these two methods, uh, that can slow it down. This is why we load images into memory, because if you had to load all of your image files into memory uh, on each frame, if you try to do that 60 times a second, your game is gonna run really, really slowly, and you're gonna turn your hard disk into a pile of slag. So uh, that helps us keep up our frame rate and uh, that, that's basically, at a very high level, how games work. So to demonstrate these concepts, I wrote a really amazing game called Winner Winner Chicken Spinner. And how this game works is the chicken there, he spins, uh, until you press the space bar. And then when you press the space bar, the game ends, it's over, and if he stops in the highlighted area, you win. If he stops outside the highlighted area, you lose. The game is over. Uh, so the implementation of that game, uh, it goes like this. So uh, first, we're inheriting from Gosu window. Uh, at the bottom there, we're, we're uh, instantiating our game and we're calling the show method on it. I don't know why I named this game window. That's a terrible name. Uh, it should have been winner, winner, chicken, spinner, window. Um, so, so anyway, here's the implementation of initialize. 
we have uh, first we have the three responsibilities of initialize, and I kind of made different code paragraphs for the responsibilities. Uh, first, it's responsible for setting up the window. Uh, it's saying, okay, superclass, make the window 480 by 480. Uh, it's setting the title of the window to winner, winner, chicken, spinner. Um, if the game were full screen, we would set that up. Uh, second, it's loading all of our assets into memory. So uh, the, <clears throat> the way we do that is we just instantiate the image class. We give it a path. These are just PNG files. There's no fancy games only image format here, just PNG files. Uh, we have the chicken plate disc thing. Uh, we have the arrow. Uh, and then we have two different images at the end of the game. If the player wins, we're gonna draw that fantastic win logo. And if they lose, uh, the sad lose logo on top of everything. Uh, the last bit there is setting up the initial state of the game. So. Winner, winner, chicken, spinner has really three pieces of state. It has the current rotation of the chicken because each frame we're gonna rotate that chicken a little bit so he starts spinning. Um, it has a game over flag so we know to stop spinning the chicken uh, when, when the user presses the space bar. And it has a one flag so we can tell are we showing the win image or the lose image on the game over screen. The update function, uh, remember, is responsible for checking for user input, and it's responsible for updating the state of the game. Uh, so if, if the game is over, like the user's press space bar, uh, this function does nothing, uh, because the user can't press space bar again, and not, n they can't cheat. Um, however, if the game is not over, we want to check to see if the user has pressed the space bar in this frame. So if they did, uh, we, can, we can use the button down method um, and it has a little constant called KB space. All the keys on the keyboard have these constants. They're all in the Gosu docs. Uh, but if they press the space bar, we're gonna set that game over flag. We're gonna set the one flag to whether or not we won and that just looks at the current angle of the chicken to figure that out. And uh, it was a lot of trial and error to come up with those numbers. There, were no, there was no trick there. Uh, and uh, if neither of those things are true, we're just gonna rotate the chicken by 10 degrees by adding 10 to the chicken angle. And that, that is all update does. Uh, the draw method, uh, remember, all it's doing is it's saying I'm gonna render the state of the game to the screen. Whatever the game looks like right now, I'm just gonna draw that. Uh, so the arrow, the little blue arrow that you saw, we're always gonna draw that to the screen. Um, that's it x equals 320, y equals 200. Uh, it's important to note in Gosu that the origin of 00 is on the top left-hand corner of the, the game window, not the bottom left-hand corner. So as you go down, your y uh, coordinate goes up. Uh, some game frameworks like to do bottom left, some like to do top left. I don't really know why, but uh, Gosu is a, is a top left kind of framework. Uh, the last number there is the z index. And if, if you do any web development, you're probably familiar with that. It's just the, uh, the draw order of the images. The arrow will be on top of anything uh, with a Z index less than one and under anything with a Z index greater than one. Uh, the next bit is drawing the chicken plate. So we're going to use the draw ROT method because we want to rotate it. Uh, it's the same XYZ stuff there, but we have the angle and degrees that we want to rotate the chicken. Uh, you'll note we're not setting it or changing the angle, we're simply drawing the angle that the update method has set. Um, finally, the, uh, the game over uh, state. So if the game is over, we want to draw the game over screen. And the game over screen depends on whether or not the, if we won the game. And if we won the game, uh, we want to draw the win image, otherwise we're going to draw the lose image and we're gonna draw it at a Z index of two, so it's on top of, of all the other stuff on the screen. And that's actually all the code there is in Winner Winner Chicken Spinner. But Winner Winner Chicken Spinner is a very, very simple game, and if you came to a talk about making games, you probably have like ideas in your brain about games you wanna build, and they don't look anything like that. So, uh, 
we're going to make another very simple game, a toy game, uh, but it will have, it's a little platform game, and that has a lot of uh, important kind of mechanics, pieces of games that you'll, you'll, will map to pretty much any kind of game you want to build. So you don't have to make that huge mental leap uh, from winner, winner, chicken spinner to what do I actually want to do. Uh, so let's jump right into the code on this guy. Uh, so first the idea is we have a little guy uh, and we want to be able to move him around on the ground just like a real platform game and we want him to, to be able to jump. Uh, so we're going to make a new game. Uh, this one's called Running Hero. Uh, and we have two images right now, the hero image and the background image. We're going to load those into memory, and then we're just going to draw them statically on the screen. Uh, you know how to do this from Winner, Winner, Chicken, Spinner. Uh, the next bit is we're going to make our guy be able to walk, or at least be able to slide along the ground in an orderly fashion. So in a platform game, the rules of movement are that the player can move to the left or the right, uh, but he can't move up and down. Uh, and, and if you want to build like your top-down, like Zelda kind of game, uh, you just change the perspective, and then the player can walk up and down too. The same principles apply though. So all we got to do to walk, we're going to store the current position of the hero uh, in an array with with the x and the y coordinate. Um, and in the update function, remember update is going to check for that user input. It's also going to change the state of the game. So when they press the right arrow, we're going to want to update that position by, uh, by changing the x coordinate. And when they press the left arrow, we're going to want to subtract from that x coordinate. Uh, so we wrote this little move function that does that. Um, it just adds or subtracts 5 to the, to the x coordinate based on uh, the speed thing, which you can set and change uh, to make your hero a little faster. Uh, the only change I had to make to the draw function was just Quit using, uh, quit using hard-coded numbers and start using our position uh, when we're rendering our hero. And that's all there is to drawing the hero and make him, making him be able to slide across the screen. Uh, jumping is a little trickier, and, and you kind of have to think about how jumping works in real life, and then you sort of have to like dumb that down for games. Um, and I kind of just made this up for this talk, so there's probably some way better way to do this, but this is a simple way, and it made sense to me. So how jumping works in Running Hero is you can only jump if you're on the ground, so there's no double jumping antics, but when you jump, you get a certain amount of vertical velocity. And then each frame, the game's going to look. Does the, does the hero have vertical velocity? If so, I'm going to move their Y coordinate up by that number, and then I'm going to divide their vertical velocity by some, some amount of gravity. And then eventually they're going, to, they're going to run out of vertical velocity. They're going to be at zero. And then they're going to start falling. So I'm going to give them negative one vertical velocity. And then each frame I'll be multiplying that velocity times gravity. Uh, so they'll go faster and faster and faster until they hit the ground. And then we can, they can jump again. Uh, so maybe some code is a better way to explain that. So uh, the implementation of that, uh, just in the update function, if the user presses the space bar, we're going to call this jump function. Uh, it just does nothing uh, if, if the user's already in the air. Um, otherwise, it'll give them a vertical velocity of 30 pixels per frame. Uh, the other change to the update function is we're going to call this, uh, this handle jump function, which is going to do all that math we just described. Uh, and, and updating the hero's position and updating vertical velocity. Uh, the implementation of that, uh, we have this gravity constant of 1.75. It just has to be greater than 1. Uh, I just fiddled around until I found a good feeling number. You will see that a lot in my game. It's just most of these numbers are just made up. Uh, the ground level, uh, I, I can talk about that in a second. It's just the Y coordinate where the hero is standing on the ground because that is currently how we're going to find out that we've landed. Uh, the next bit, just subtracting the vertical velocity from the hero's y coordinate, uh, because remember the top of the screen is y equals zero, so as you go up, your vertical velocity goes down, um, and then when you have negative vertical velocity, uh, your y coordinate will start going up again. Um, <clears throat> the next paragraph thing there is uh, just changing the vertical velocity uh, 
So if the vertical velocity is zero, uh, that means the hero is at the top of the jump and we need to start falling. So we'll give them a vertical velocity of negative one. So on the next frame, they'll start falling. Uh, if their vertical velocity is negative, uh, that means they are falling. So we're gonna multiply their vertical velocity times the, the gravity constant. So they're falling a little faster on the next frame. And uh, if they're going up, then we wanna divide the vertical velocity by the gravity constant. So they go up a little less on the next frame. Uh, the last bit there, like I said, uh, so when we get back on the ground, we need to know that we're back on the ground, otherwise we're just gonna fall forever. So uh, how we're doing that is our ground is a straight line, so the hero is always at the same Y coordinate when he's standing on the ground. Um, so we could just look at the Y coordinate. If it's at the ground level, then we can stop jumping. Uh, since this is a platform game, eventually you're gonna get to the point where you have platforms to jump on, that kind of thing. Uh, you'll, the logic will have to change. You'll have to use something like collision detection to know if you're on the ground or not. <clears throat> uh, but that's, that's actually all there is to jumping and to walking. So now our guy, he can walk and he can jump. But he does look a little silly uh, because he cannot look to the left, which is sad. And he also kind of just moves like a cutout paper doll and not, not like a real hero, you know. It doesn't feel like a game yet, it feels like a toy. Uh, so in this chunk, we're gonna animate the guy. We're gonna add a few poses to him and make him look uh, like way better. <clears throat> so to make the guy be able to look to the left, uh, we're going to need to know which way he's facing and that can change as the game changes so we need a new piece of state. Um, so we're gonna store the direction he's facing we're gonna update that direction in our move function because that's the only way currently that our player can be turned around to face the other way uh, is that they start walking the other way. Uh, and then we're gonna do this little trick in the draw function. So one way you could do this is that you have a left facing image for every image in the game, uh, but that tends to get a little unwieldy and it's a little hacky. So a better way to do it is that the, the draw function on the image class has a, a scale X and a scale Y parameter. And if you set those things to negative numbers, it actually will mirror the image and make it face the other way on that axis. So if you set, uh, if you set scale X to negative one, it's gonna flip the hero over back the other way and he's gonna be facing the other, other direction back to back with his original position. Uh, to compensate for the fact that we just moved the hero to the, uh, to the left by his width, we're gonna add the width back to the X coordinate. So now our hero can be standing in the same spot, but he can turn around and can face the other way. So pretty neat little trick there. Um, so now our guy can look to the left, he can look to the right, uh, but now we need to animate him. So animation in Gosu is very simple, and by simple, I mean you're on your own. So. <laughs> So what, what you do is you get an array of images and each frame you just decide this is the one I'm gonna draw this frame. So you load up you know, all of your stuff into an array and then, uh, and then you pick based on the state of the game which of these am I gonna draw. Uh, fortunately we have a really easy way to get a bunch of images into an array uh, and that's by using sprite sheets. So sprite sheets are a very, very common uh, tool in games development. Uh, you just basically take all of your images that you want, you make them all the same size, and then you put them all in a bigger image. Uh, and then you load them into your, into your game and you say, all of my sub images are this size, cut them out for me. And it'll do that for you. Uh, this is usually done for complicated graphics card reasons, but in Running Hero it's done because it makes the code nicer. Um, <clears throat> that uh, the thing there behind the blue wall is our uh, our sprite sheet. So we have seven poses for our hero. We have the standing still and doing nothing pose. We have three uh, frames of animation for walking. So if you play these in a loop, it looks like walking. It's called a walk cycle. Uh, the fifth the fifth image is the player kind of with his arms out going up. I don't like I don't know why this is going up. I've never jumped like that. 
but that is what going up looks like for our hero. Uh, for going down, our hero is kind of looking down at the ground. Uh, and then the last image there is like our, our hero has been hurt and he's stunned uh, or just very surprised. <clears throat> so to, uh, to build all this animation, all these poses into our game, uh, in the initialize function, remember we load assets there, we're going we're gonna to use the load tiles class function on the image class. We're going to give it our sprite sheet, and we're going to say our sprites are 64 by 64. So load those all uh, into memory, and this, this will just return that array for us of, of regular images. Uh, we also need to keep track of which image we're going to show on this frame. So we have this piece of state called the current hero image, which update is going to check, or which update is going to set, and then draw hero or draw is going to draw. Uh, so in uh, in update, <clears throat> we're going to look at the state of the game to figure out which frame to draw. So if the hero is jumping. Uh, that means uh, they have a vertical velocity, and based on that vertical velocity, we're gonna decide to use the going up or coming down image. Uh, if they have a positive vertical velocity, we'll use the going up image. If they have a negative vertical velocity, we'll use the going down image. Uh, otherwise, if the hero is walking, one of the weird things about this is that the hero can be jumping and walking at the same time. <clears throat> so if the hero is walking, um, then uh, we will just use the, one of these three images uh, in the walk cycle. And uh, you don't wanna just loop through these like one per frame because your game runs at 60 frames a second and this animation looks ridiculous at 60 frames a second. So you wanna slow that way down without slowing down your whole game. Uh, so how we do that is we can take uh, the number of milliseconds since the game started, divide it by 100 and that gives us 10 frames a second. Uh, so we just take that number modulo three, and that gives us a loop, you know, zero, one, two, zero, one, two. Uh, we add one to that, and then we get the right offsets in the, uh, in the array for uh, the hero image that we need to show this frame. <clears throat> uh, finally, if the hero is neither jumping nor walking, uh, we're gonna just set the current hero image to the, uh, the resting hero image, the first hero image. And the only change we had to make in the draw function was that we want to use the current hero image uh, instead of that old uh, static hero. And uh, shockingly, that is all that it took to animate our guy. And actually, he looks a lot better right now. And he's feeling great about life. <clears throat> However, our game is missing a plot. It's missing drama. And to have drama, you need to have pain. And you need to have suffering. And in games, in order to have pain and to have suffering, you have to have collision detection. And so we want our guy to be able to slam into things. We want our guy to be able to get hurt. And so we're going to add a bad guy who currently doesn't do anything, so he's not really that bad. He's more of a painful obstacle. Um, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to let us start building collision detection to our game. Uh, so how does collision detection work? Uh, well, in our game, we are going to put rectangles, imaginary rectangles, around our hero and around all the stuff that our hero can run into. Uh, and then we're going to look for uh, intersections of those rectangles. And if there's an intersection, that means there's a collision. Uh, there are other ways to do this. There's so-called pixel-perfect collision detection, uh, which will tell you exactly which pixels overlapped between two things on the screen. Uh, but Basically, every platformer I ever played as a kid used rectangles, uh, and it's very, it feels great, it feels good. It's also very conceptually simple. Uh, it, it is, you can run these in constant time, so it doesn't matter how big the, the things are that you want to detect collisions are. Uh, the collision detection is always just uh, very easy math. Um, and it's, it's totally good enough for our game. So this is what we're going to do. Uh, so let's draw our enemy into place. Uh, so we, we just have a static enemy image for now. Uh, we are going to draw, uh, use this draw collision bodies method, which I'm going to talk about in a second. It just draws rectangles around uh, the physics bodies in the game so you can see, like, where do your rectangles need to be? Uh, we have <clears throat> a couple changes in the update method. So first of all, our hero can feel pain now. So we have this hurt until timer thing. Uh, 
So our hero can be hurt for a little bit, but then we want him to recover. So how this works is we're going to set, if the hero gets hurt, we're going to set hurt until to some time in the future. And then if that is set, we're going to say, okay, the hero's hurt. Uh, once you get past that time, you can unset it. The, uh, the last bit there is we're just going to call this handle collisions function because we need something to uh, detect and respond to collisions in our game. Uh, and how is it going to respond? So a couple, a couple different modes of collision detection uh, that can happen in our game. First of all, the hero can run into the enemy from the side, like from the left or the right. And when that happens, that means the hero made a mistake. Uh, so he should be, he should be hurt. Um, and in order to hurt the hero, we're going to knock him back 30 pixels, and, and then we're going to you know, stun him for a little bit. However, if we collide with uh, the bottom of the hero, that means the hero jumped on the enemy's head. And as we all know, if you jump on the enemy's head, you did a good thing and the enemy should die. So, that, so uh, right now we don't know how to kill an enemy, so no, we're not going to talk about that. But we are going to give the hero a little bounce, uh, which is a very cheerful celebration of jumping on the enemy's head. Uh, so handle collisions is implemented like this. Uh, the first third of the code there is just defining the rectangle around the player and around the enemy. Uh, there are a billion ways to describe rectangles in code. I chose the worst one, which is to use a hash. Um, but it looks good on slides, so that's why I went with that. In real life, I probably would have used a struct or uh, even just an array with the two corners specified is probably a superior way to specify a rectangle. Um, the, uh, the next bit there is we're calling this check for collisions function, which for now all you need to know is it takes two rectangles. Uh, if there's a collision between those two rectangles, it's going to return the direction of that collision relative to the hero. So uh, if the hero gets hit on the left side, it's going to return the symbol left. Uh, if the hero gets uh, hit on the bottom side, we're going to return bottom. Uh, and then the logic for how to deal with those collisions the, uh, if you get hit on the left or the right, that means you want to get knocked back by 30 pixels. And uh, we're going to set the hurt until timer to the current time plus 200 milliseconds, which again, just a magic number I made up because it felt, it felt pretty good. Uh, <clears throat> if you collide with the bottom of the hero, however, you want that little bounce. So uh, to bounce, all you need to do is set that jumping flag to true and give the hero a vertical velocity of, of 10 pixels per frame. Uh, the check for collisions function I just described. Um, so first you need to get the, the intersection uh, of the, the, the two rectangles you were given. So uh, this is very simple math. If you had like three minutes and a piece of paper, you could figure out how to get the intersection of two rectangles. But uh, I just got my answer off Stack Overflow. <laughs> And uh, if, uh, if there is an intersection, we can use that intersection as a heuristic for figuring out the direction that the collision came from. Um, the reason we can do this is because, uh, okay, so if the, if the intersection is wider than it is tall, so if it's like a landscape style intersection, uh, we can know with high probability that the intersection came from the top or the bottom of the hero rectangle. Uh, the reason for that is because the rules of the game don't allow you to intersect very deeply with another rectangle. Like, it'll stop you. It'll knock you back 30 pixels or you'll bounce off the enemy's head. Um, so if, if, there, if it's wider than it is tall, that means, okay, these rectangles aren't very thin. It's probably a top-bottom collision. And otherwise, it's a left-right collision uh, for the same reasons. So... Knowing that, we can uh, look at the, the top of the intersection and the top of the hero rectangle and decide if it's a top collision by checking if they're the same. Because if they're the same, that means the top of the hero's rectangle is pushing through the bottom of some other rectangle. Uh, and if it's a wide intersection and it's not a top collision, then it must be a bottom collision. So the same kind of trick applies to the left-right thing. If we know it's a left-right collision, we can look at the left of the intersection and the left of the hero rectangle. And uh, if they're the same, it's a left collision. Otherwise, it must be a right collision. 
That was a lot of words and not very many diagrams. Uh, so this is that uh, draw, draw collision bodies function I talked about. Uh, you should definitely do this if you're going to write a game with collision detection because it's very tricky to dial these numbers in without having some visual aid. Uh, all it is is just drawing, uh, drawing four lines, makes a rectangle. Uh, Gosu has built-in drawing functions. Draw line is a, is a neat one. Um, so I set a debug flag whenever I want to draw the physics bodies in the game. Uh, and that's, that's all there is to collision detection. So now our guy can get hurt, he can bounce off the enemy, uh, and he can celebrate and triumph. So the very last bit of the game, so we, we want to make it flesh it out a little more. We want to be able to kill the enemy. We want the enemy to be a little bit smarter. And uh, we want to be able to keep score. So uh, the first thing I did was I separated the enemy class out as its own entity uh, because <clears throat> eventually your game is just going to get unwieldy if you leave it in one class forever. Uh, so this is one way you can start moving out various uh, entities in your game. Uh, to have their own logic. Also, maybe we want to make a bunch of enemies, and so this is a neat way to do it. Uh, so we implement a update, a draw, and a body method on the enemy class here. Uh, the update and draw methods are just called on all enemies in the appropriate method in the game. So every update uh, call is going to call update on all the enemies. Every draw call is going to call draw on all the enemies. The enemies know how to draw themselves. The enemies know how to update their state as the game progresses. Uh, the body method just returns the rectangle uh, for collision detection because the game itself is still going to be responsible for detecting those, those collisions. Uh, so here's how we plug that in. Uh, we have, uh, we're going to instantiate an enemy uh, in our initialize function. We're, we're giving it a sprite sheet now instead of just a static image. Um, you could make many enemies. We're just going to make one for this, the purposes of this talk. Uh, in our update function, we're going to call update on all of our enemies. Uh, in our draw function, we're going to call draw on all of our enemies. And in our collision detection function, we're going to loop through all of our enemies and we're going to check for collisions on all of them. Otherwise, the logic remains the same. And since we have that in place, uh, we can now implement the draw and update functions on the enemy to handle those bits. Uh, so the draw function on the enemy uh, the enemy only has two states. He can either be uh, alive, which means he's walking around, or dead, which means he's squashed. So in our sprite sheet for our enemy, we have four frames of animation. Uh, so we just do the same kind of thing we did with the hero with the, the milliseconds trick to loop uh, to slow down the animation. Um, and uh, if the enemy is dead, we have a little squashed enemy image there on the end. Uh, the call to draw just uses some ternary stuff to figure out if the enemy's facing the other way. And if he is, flip him over so he's facing the right direction. Uh, the update function is responsible for uh, the brains of the enemy. So if the enemy's dead, the enemy's brain is no longer functioning, so it doesn't do anything. Um, otherwise, uh, we want to move the enemy five pixels in the direction he's facing. Uh, and if the enemy walks off the screen, then we want to turn him around so he's facing the other way, so he starts walking back. Um, so <clears throat> besides AI and besides uh, drawing the enemy, we want to be able to keep score. So we're going to have this new piece of score state. Uh, it starts at a zero, as one might expect. Uh, we're going to load a font into memory. Uh, this is just a TTF file, nothing too fancy. Uh, you give it a size. You say it's a 64-point font and load this file. Uh, then in the draw function, we're just going to say, hey, font, draw the score in the top left corner of the screen. And draw will happily oblige. Finally, to get points, uh, we're just going to update our update coll or handle collisions function. So when we have that bottom collision, uh, we're going to set the enemy's alive flag to false. And we're going to increment our score. And uh, that is the final product of Running Hero. Uh, so you can see we could jump on the enemy's head. We can get points. We have drama. 
Um, and you can imagine how, like, going from here, okay, well, you could make this a full game. You could, you could add an endless number of enemies coming at you that get smarter and better. You could add power-ups and, and, and weapons and, and all kinds of stuff. You could make platforms and levels and goals. Uh, and hopefully, uh, you have a starting point where you could start to think, okay, well, that, that's how I would do that in Gosu. Uh, a couple of resources for your, uh, your game development uh, career. Uh, highly recommend uh, Open Game Art, huge resource. Uh, if, if you look at the game development community, this is like the one everybody says, use this. Uh, the hero image and the enemy image, both CC0 images I pulled off of Open Game Art. Uh, you can go there and, and build a collection uh, of images for, for a game idea you've got. You can just go there for inspiration. They have sound effects, music, uh, tons of art, uh, just a, a great resource. Uh, for tools, um, for image manipulation, you can use whatever you want. You don't need anything super fancy, but if you got Photoshop, you might as well. Uh, I use Paint and Paint-like tools. Uh, I think I use Pinta on the Mac, uh, but also occasionally PicoPixel, which is a dedicated pixel editor. All that stuff is free. Uh, I highly recommend the Tiled Map Editor. So when, when you're building a game, uh, you're going to start building up all these chunks of games like, okay, well, I've built this kind of enemy thing, I built this kind of block, uh, and you're going to want to lay out your levels, your maps. Uh, you can load all of your stuff into Tiled, and then it'll export JSON or XML. You can parse that in, <coughs> excuse me, you can parse that in your game, and uh, it, makes, it makes building levels so much nicer. Uh, highly recommend that tool. Of course, you can get Gosu, all the docs for Gosu, a really great tutorial on Gosu, uh, from libgosu.org. Uh, highly recommend it. Hi, uh, check it out. Um, so I hope you all feel inspired to make your own games now. I hope you feel at least a little more equipped to go make games now. Um, and uh, I, thanks for coming to my talk. I think we have about a couple minutes if anybody has any questions. Uh, so for testing. Okay, so Testing uh, in Gosu, you can write unit tests that do things like send keystrokes to the game. Uh, testing in games is really fidgety because there's so much that can happen. There's a lot of state uh, that has to be set up. And so uh, TDD in game development doesn't seem like to be much of a thing, uh, but certainly like sanity checks and tests like that are a lot more appropriate uh, in game development. It's a lot more experimental and like, okay, I did a thing, how does it look, how does it feel, kind of, kind of uh, iterative development. Uh, the, most f the most fun game I've made with Gosu, man, all my games are terrible. Okay, so, okay, so the most terrible game I made with Gosu, I made a game uh, that was really just kind of this stupid art game, but it, it has this little fly and he starts buzzing around on the screen, and then you slap the fly, and then more flies appear, and then you kill more flies, uh, and, and then uh, eventually you run out of time, and the game ends, and you just try to get as high a score as possible. Like, uh, I don't have it with me, sorry. But uh, I'll put it on my GitHub so, uh, so everybody can see how bad I am at this. Uh, my GitHub, uh, it's on the first slide, github.com slash Chamberlain. Uh, yeah, there's the link to the GitHub. Uh, all these slides and all the code for this talk will be on, uh, on that GitHub. Uh, do I think they're going to make a library to write VR games? Uh, in Ruby, I think it would be tough uh, just because 3D is more computationally uh, intensive. Uh, it, it might be possible, but I think it would be, it would be very constrained by the performance uh, of Ruby. Is there a 3D library? I, I don't know of one. There, there probably is, but I'm not aware of one. Yeah, so the question is, uh, the question is, uh, like, why do you draw the, the same images in every frame? Does that sum it up? So my understanding of how it, it ends up working is that you sort of end up with a blank slate each frame, uh, and, like, for video memory reasons or whatever. And so you're actually g just going to redraw everything every frame anyway. Um, but I if you think about... If you think about games from the point of view of like regular application development, it seems very weird that I have to keep drawing this thing all the time. But under the covers, 
your, your graphics card has to redraw things every frame. So this is just getting very explicit about that. No more questions? All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank <laughs> you.